I always hated walking, or more specifically hiking or rambling, whatever you want to call it. It always made me think of wandering into an endless eternity, like you were trapped in an endless loop that threw your sanity apart like a ragdoll. You may think that's a little dramatic, but let me explain. I'm what some people would call a psychopath. Let me just say that we prefer to be called the Empathy Impaired. That was a little joke I came up with. A lot of these mental health professionals will tell you that we psychopaths have no empathy. But I would argue that if you say a psychopath lacks empathy, that is a sign that you need to search your own knowledge for a broader definition of the term. Because you see, we like to manipulate and feed off the emotions of others. So we do not lack empathy. We are just collectors who never remove the product from the packaging. Psychopathy is a mental disorder found in a small number of people, but it can have such a catastrophic effect on society. I feel like one of the chosen ones. You may also notice that I'm rather sophisticated. Surely somebody like you wouldn't have that trait. Could they? You'd no doubt thinking. You know, if psychopaths looked and sounded like psychopaths, then they wouldn't be doing any psychopathing now, would they? Or maybe they still would. We tend not to care. How many times can I say the word psychopath? Make a drinking game out of it, I don't care. To clear up any confusion, I came from a middle class home in the county of Cheshire. I had a good education, top of my class in fact. But I always knew I was meant for a darker path mentally. Me and my mother would walk along this pavementy part of this aqueduct to a public footpath that would eventually lead to a small village called Irthing every weekend. It was eight miles there and back again. To her, but not to me. To me, it seemed like an endless walk into hell. Excessive walking would always make me feel like my sanity was deteriorating at a rate so fast and so alarming, I couldn't even describe it. Everything would start to twist and contort like a Picasso painting. Colours would start to become these blinding lights that made me feel like I was being struck by beams of acid. The pain in my head became so intense, I could hear my own heart beat in my ears. And it was like a mighty roar. I never truly got to the bottom of why this was. The various doctors my mother took me to see over the years said I was just crazy. That was the nicest thing anybody had ever said to me. My mother was a short but slim meerkat of a woman. She kept on taking me on these walks regardless. She said, If the doctor says it's because you're mental, then you've got to face your fears. Face... my fears. I guess that's about to come about. I'm not entirely sure how I got here, but what I do know is, last night I may have overdone it on some narcotics and alcohol while sat alone in my dank little apartment, and woke up here. Where exactly is here, you ask? Well, for the life of me, I truly don't know why, of all places, I'd come here. I awoke in moderate pain, headache, dizziness, eyes stung a little, but nothing unbearable. What concerned me more was where I was. I had been lying unconscious on the footpath of that aqueduct, that same aqueduct from my childhood, the one that led to the most hated path of agony and disdain. I stood up, and despite my feelings towards this place, I began to walk. The mild pain I was in began to fade, and it had gone. For now, even though I hated walking long distances, because it drove me so insane, and the physical symptoms would cause me so much grief, I knew the only thing to do was head to that stupid little village, Irthing. I didn't mind things like walking to the local shop or to work, it never affected me then. Perhaps you could argue that these episodes I have are to do with my serious mental state. Yeah. The aqueduct was very high up as aqueducts tend to be, a mighty Roman structure, originally constructed to supply towns and cities with water, 
and now barges travel across it. People hiring out those boats for the weekend, getting drunk and dropping their cans and spilling their drinks into the water. The way the mind works is it will often try to come up with elaborate plans to change society. In the Romans' case, for the better, and in my case, for the better of me. I certainly don't cause harm to others for my health, you know. All the times I've been on the run from the authorities, hiding in the most horrendous disease ridden of places. More for the stimulation, the constant stimulation, that I need to feel. And it certainly doesn't come from playing Monopoly. Once, when I was six years old, I was on that walk with my mother. We had just begun that cursed journey along the aqueduct, and all of a sudden, this canal boat came around the corner, blasting pop music, people screaming and shrieking like ghouls. They had their beers, and were pretty drunk. The noise triggered one of my episodes. I fell to the ground, head in my hands. Come on, stop this silliness. You need to get over your fear. She should have had that on a t-shirt. I began to rub my temples as the boat got closer. The noise became louder, and the attack became more severe. The whooshing noise in my ears started to sound like explosions in sync with my pulse. The colours and the sounds of everything around me started to mix together in a way that terrified me. Everything looked like some sadistic artist's muse. As the canal boat went past, one of those morons on there threw a beer can at me while I was on the ground in pain. Bullseye, he said. So then, an overwhelming anger came over me. I don't know how I did it. Whether it was adrenaline or what, but me. A six-year-old boy leapt onto the canal boat and grabbed the trollop who threw the beer can at me. And somehow, with all my strength, I managed to throw this boy, who looked about 19, off the canal boat from the front where he was standing. So he'd go perfectly into the water while his friends watched in horror. After he hit the water... He tried to climb back, but before he could, the boat whacked his head. He was unconscious. One of his friends jumped in and pulled him onto the footpath. Another friend stopped the boat. It was a sudden stop that seemed to make us wobble quite violently. But nothing compared to the violence that had just happened. But, as an aqueduct is a masterpiece of Roman engineering, what I do is a masterpiece of ways to keep the world on their toes. Being called bad guy, so society doesn't have to be, for all its faults. It's a service I provide. And that's why those hooligans being so disrespectful to the aqueduct touch such a nerve with me. If you want to stay on my good side, you should never disrespect a masterpiece. After the incident, Mother didn't speak to me for a while. Daddy was so wrapped up in his work that not even something like this would get him to give me the time of day. Naturally, there were various little ripples, such as the police being called and TV privileges being taken. The family of the boy decided not to press charges because he would make a full recovery. Lovely. Back to my current predicament. After I'd made it off the aqueduct's footpath and onto the one along the canal... I continued walking, past that little tea shop my mother dragged me into on various occasions. It was a very cramped, modest little place. So cramped, you could barely move around even when it wasn't busy. The decor was quite fancy. Victorian tables and chairs and paintings of people who appeared to be lords and ladies of the manor. And that charming but odd stripy wallpaper. I always had a piece of lemon drizzle cake. It was one of the few redeeming qualities of this ridiculous pastime of my mother's. I approached it and looked through the window. It was a very different sight I was seeing at that moment. The place looked like it had been ransacked. Some of the Victorian tables and chairs were knocked over and burnt badly. The paintings of the lords and ladies had their eyes scratched out and rude words written on them and moustaches and glasses drawn all over in what appeared to be red crayon. I was shocked, and wondered what had happened here. 
This little tea shop was actually once considered a safe haven for me. And I love those paintings. Somebody had messed with a masterpiece. I was shocked and wondered what had happened here. This little tea shop was actually once considered a safe haven for me. And I love those paintings. Somebody had messed with a masterpiece. I looked around, trying to find a clue to what had happened. Something caught my eye. Something that would turn out to be much more sinister than it initially appeared to be very soon. All of the tables and chairs had been burnt, violently broken and knocked over. I had a past. I knew the signs. One table was left completely intact with a note on it and even more bizarrely a walkie-talkie. I examined a cheap looking rusty thing left behind by some nutter who tried to rob the place, trying to communicate with the big boss or whoever. I thought I should peruse the note, so I could try to track down the sorry idiots who dared disrespect this masterpiece. But the first two words on that note chilled me to the bone. Dear Colin, Colin was my name. A shiver so powerful it felt like 50,000 volts of electric went straight through my body. I tried to tell myself this was one of the enemies I'd made over the years trying to get to me somehow. But my gut told me something much darker was at play. And little did I know that soon I'd wish it was one of my enemies. I was perplexed and scared, but I decided to read on. Dear Colin... We hope the footpath is to your liking. We're very excited to have you here. You're going to see a lot of strange stuff, but if you manage to get to Friday without being disemboweled, we just might send you a fruit basket. Your guide is Safilru. He will be looking after your case. Take the hand radio with you. You will need it. We wish you the very best of luck. Sincerely, the Intuition Knights. Who were the Intuition Knights? Some kind of a gang? And who was this Sefilru? Some kind of enforcer with an interesting name? Speculation was getting me nowhere, so I left the tea shop so I could get to Irthing and maybe make some sense of this madness. I opened the door to the tea shop, but something horrific was there to greet me. A terrifying scream of a woman came from nowhere. And I saw a face. A face I'll never forget, no matter how brief that first encounter. It was the face of an old man standing right in front of me, like he'd been waiting outside to surprise me, staring at me with a vacant but murderous expression. He was there for two long seconds and then I swear what happened next is a hundred percent true. He just vanished into thin air, right in front of me. Because the man's face was so terrifying, I'll never forget it. His eyes were big and dead, and had very dark circles under them. His bone structure was very skeleton-like, and he had this thin bony nose. I could see that he was wearing a hood, like the villain in some sort of fantasy novel. The surprise encounter left me hyperventilating like a man possessed, which would turn out to be very ironic in hindsight and I almost fell to the ground I was so intimidated. Me, somebody who dedicated his life to making others feel afraid. I surmised that this was that Safilru, come to put the Frighteners on me using magic tricks. Of course, the worst part is, it worked. There and then, things got so much worse. No longer than ten seconds after that I heard a loud bang. I looked in the direction it came from, and I saw fire and a huge blaze at that. Emerging from the fire was a very familiar and unwelcome sight. That canal boat, the one that those idiots were on, throwing and spilling their beer into the water, only this time, the canal boat looked more like a nightmarish viking ship being spat out of Valhalla and sent to hell. The paintwork was all black, and those same rude words, and some drawings of people being hung from a rope while a crowd cheered, and other drawings of things too horrible even for me to mention or condone for that matter. 
but I easily recognize the crew. The teenagers from that incident in my childhood, they looked pretty much like they did back then, except their eyes were pitch black, like looking into endless portals of void and macabre. When they smiled, and they were smiling, the teeth were rotten and worms and cockroaches were crawling out of their mouths. Their skin was pale and sickly and covered in veins just as black and unsettling as their eyes. They had sharp, black claws for nails, and their hair was greasy and looked rotten. The boy who I had assaulted when I was six, he was pointing at me with one of those black claws and spoke in a voice that would make Jack the Ripper quiver. I remember you. Then he made the universal symbol for cutting somebody's throat. The others were cheering and leering at me, as if they wanted to eat me. When the boat got right in front of me, he picked up a beer can and threw it at me. My instincts immediately kicked in, and I dived out of the way, and I was right. As the beer can flew through the air, it turned into a fireball and crashed to the ground and exploded with the same bang I had heard earlier. The fire spread and was getting closer to me, and I found myself running away from this raging fire and the monsters that were pursuing me by boat. Another beer can was thrown at me, this one hitting me but it wasn't fire. This can exploded into acid and unfortunately came into contact with my leg. I fell to the ground in so much pain. I looked at my leg. I could see my trousers and skin being dissolved and burning and mixing together as one. I started to scream. I was in so much pain. I heard a thump and looked up. I saw one of the creatures standing over me. It wasn't the ringleader. It was a female. She grabbed me by the neck and with such strength threw me into the water as I had done to her friend once. I began to sink. This wasn't shallow water. It was extremely deep. I'm not sure if I was right or wrong, but I'm sure below me in the depths. I saw hideous sea monsters too blood-curdling to describe. If I hadn't done what I'd done next, that boy who had once thrown into the water, who I terrified, would have fed them their dinner. Then I could just about see a figure swimming towards me. As it got closer, I could see it was the boy still grinning at me with insects crawling out of his nightmarish mouth. He was about to go in for the kill. I then did the only thing I could think of. I grabbed hold of him, spun him around and held him by the neck and began pushing with my legs to swim to land and oxygen. Adrenaline always seemed to be on my side when I needed it most. Though the creature struggled the whole way there, he couldn't seem to free himself from my grip. When we submerged, and of course, after I took a big gulp of air, I looked at the boat, and the other creatures, they seemed so disappointed I was still alive. I managed to climb back onto the footpath from the water, holding the group's leader like a hostage. Come after me, and he gets it. Considering they were vicious and insane, the creatures seemed genuinely worried about their friend. I started to back away, until I was about to head round the corner to the next part of the footpath, to Worthing. I wasn't sure what to do with my hostage, so I did the same thing I did to him the last time I saw him, when he was human. I threw him into the water and ran for dear life. Don't follow me, I shouted, and thankfully they didn't. I must have ran a good mile and a half after the incident with those creatures. I ran like there was no tomorrow despite the injury to my leg. Eventually I had to stop and catch my breath. My head was pounding and my ears were washing like an insane drum beat. I checked to see if those creatures were behind me, there was no sign of them. I looked around, I also recognised this part of the walk too. Here the water split the two sides of the ground covered in fields. I distinctly remember that sometimes ducklings that had the same colours as bumblebees swam past with their mothers. Up in the distance I could see a mountain, a massive grey mountain that you could just about see the trees on, but the mountain itself was huge, so huge you could see how intimidating and powerful it really was. Suddenly the most intense pain went through my head, just like before when I was a child. Colours and shapes started to twist and become nightmarish. I started to see strange patterns of dots and flashing lights that added to my pain. The whooshing got louder too, when suddenly there was this loud thud, like somebody had leaped from a great height and landed right in front of me. I was so distracted by the pain that I couldn't quite look what it was, 
But I thought, is this one of those creatures come to finish me off? Lose something, said a very husky voice with a Welsh lilt. I looked up and it was that sinister man in the hood, with the skeletal bone structure and the intense eyes. He was looking right into my eyes, holding a walkie-talkie. You really need to take better care of these with the cutbacks. There's only so many we can give you. Cutbacks? I was very confused, but also for the first time in a very long time, scared of somebody else. I dealt with some lunatics and hard cases in my time, but this hooded man, I could tell, was very insidious and very dangerous. It had become quite clear now that I was in his world and I had to play by his rules. Are you Safilru? I said nervously. Without even blinking, he immediately said a quiet, distant, yes, like he was listening but doing the most black-hearted, malicious, unspeakable things to me in his head. Why am I here? I asked. I couldn't hold back this question any longer. I was desperate for answers. All the things going on around you, and you don't know, he replied. I had some rather nasty suspicions of what was going on at this point, that had caused fear to consume me. I was barely keeping it together. A very sinister grin appeared on his face. Both top and bottom teeth were touching. His canines were in desperate need of sanding down. He shoved the walkie-talkie right into my chest. <coughs> I shouted while grabbing hold of the walkie-talkie before it fell to the floor. It really hurt. Do you remember Dr. Simmons? Sifilru asked. I looked at him totally aghast. How did he know about Dr. Simmons? But then I remembered my suspicions that I sincerely hoped were not true. And they provided a possible answer to that question. Dr. Simmons was the only person who genuinely frightened me. He was a very tall, stocky, muscular man. He had a buzz cut and big round glasses. He also had a thick Scottish accent. A native of Glasgow, in fact. So native that he had the scars on either side of his mouth. I remember my first session with him. At the age of 22, I was sectioned under the Mental Health Act and placed in a clinic. My first therapy session with Dr. Simmons didn't go too badly, but if I knew what was to come, I was sat in a chair with another chair right in front of me in a dimly lit room. The door burst open and in he came. He had a friendly smile, but I noticed those scars straight away. Good afternoon, Colin. May I call you Colin? I nodded. I like to be on a first name basis with my patients. Some say that's frowned upon, but I say they need to get a life, he said in a jokey manner. At this point, he seemed pleasant, a competent doctor even. I even for one brief moment thought he might be the person who can help me once and for all. Now Colin, I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here for a friendly chat. Oh, okay. Good, now tell me about your childhood. And I foolishly opened up to him when better psychopaths than I would have held things back for weeks. As I said before, the first session went well, with no causes for alarm, but then the second session, that's when things got bad. I was in that same dimly lit room, waiting for Dr. Simmons, when I heard arguing. I recognised Dr. Simmons' Scottish patter, and I heard the voice of who I assumed was another doctor. The exchange got pretty heated, and I won't repeat it in its entirety, but let's just say, the other doctor came off worse when things got physical. Dr. Simmons came into the room, wheeling in a trolley. I could see there were two things on the trolley that unsettled me. One was a gas mask, attached to a canister, and the other was a hammer. Dr. Simmons picked up the hammer and sat in front of me. Sorry to keep you waiting. That's okay. Wondering what this is for? He said, holding up the hammer. Are we going to assemble a cabinet? I joked. Remember you told me about what you did to your mother with the hammer? That really touched a nerve with me. I told him that was an extremely traumatic memory, and he wants me to relive it? Somehow barely able to hide my frustration, I nodded. Good, Dr. Simmons said. He stood up and grabbed the gas mask and its tank and put it down next to him. Sitting back down, he said, 
Why don't you describe the incident to me again? I want no detail left out. But I told you this last week. I don't want to go through it again. No, no, Colin. What you did to your mother was an awful crime. And you did do that to her, Colin. It was unforgivable. An innocent woman. It just wanted what was best for you. You showed her no remorse. Yes. Yes, Colin. How could you? Freaks like you need to be punished. So here is the treatment you need. He proclaimed, gesturing towards the gas mask in the tank. This little contraption contains a variety of drugs and chemicals. Muscle relaxers, LSD, chlorine, horse tranquilizer. I've tinkered with it. Just enough that it shouldn't kill you. At least I don't think it will anyway. No, please. I begged and pleaded with him not to experiment. But that only rattled him. Don't be so ungrateful, Colin. I'm trying to help you. As your dear old mother would have always said, you've got to face your fears. He put the gas mask on me and twisted this switch type thing around. The chemicals made me feel horrendous, sick, hallucinating. I could hear that man's sinister laugh. I was gagging, wheezing, choking. I was in so much pain and there was nothing I could do about it. I heard my mother's voice telling me after the incident on that aqueduct with that boy. How could you do that, Colin? How could you act so violently? She was saying to me as the police arrived. They started to hear the sirens. Then I had visions of going on those walks I hated. I began to get the symptoms of the distress that the walk caused me. I was in a new world of agony. Then, Dr. Simmons turned off the machine. Ah, you're not dead then. That's good. I wanted to trigger those same symptoms you got from that walk, and based on what you described to me, I can tell you were having them. Now, there may or may not be some brain damage, but scum like you don't deserve to be sentient, you understand? I had fallen to the floor. I was desperately gasping for air, in fact. I looked at my hand and noticed it had become an unnerving purplish-grey colour, but it was gradually going back to normal. I looked at Dr. Simmons straight in the eye. You. You're a psychopath. I spat at him. He bent down and grabbed me by the cheeks with one hand. Takes one to no one. And threw my head on the floor. The impact from that hit made me pass out. I woke up in a room with no windows. It was so dark. You could be forgiven for thinking there was no door. I don't know why Dr. Simmons wanted to torture me in such a gruesome way. Or why he used a memory of me accidentally hitting my mother's finger with a hammer when she was holding a nail for me. Now I have my issues, but manipulating something like that to seem like I killed my own mother with a hammer to trigger distress is something I wouldn't do to my worst enemy. My mother is very much alive, by the way. She just won't talk to me. I knew one thing for certain, though. Psychopathy is the absolute need for control. The next morning, some members of staff at the clinic came in and grabbed me. They took me back to the room I had my sessions with Dr. Simmons in. Only this time, Dr. Simmons was already there. Sat down with another gas mask attached to a canister. He smiled at me. I spat on the floor. Good morning, Colin. A lot happened last night after you went into solitary. Basically, there's going to be some changes around here. The one that will affect you and your fellow residents the most is... These new cutting-edge experiments of mine will now be mandatory. I felt a shiver go through my body. But I managed to keep a brave face. Bring it. I can take it. Dr. Simmons smiled. That's my boy. He grabbed the gas mask and canister. I've added a new ingredient just for you. Utilised carbon monoxide. Now again, I've used my chemistry know-how to try and make sure it doesn't kill you. But, with this new ingredient, well, I can't promise anything. As he brought that gas mask towards my face, I knew it was now or never, and this guy had had his free shot. I sprung to my feet and kicked him right where the suns didn't shine. He fell to the ground in pain. I then got hold of the canister and hit him over the head with it as he tried to get to his feet. What I did next must have been ruled by the same adrenaline I had during the incident with that boy when I was six. 
I grabbed the evil Dr. Simmons and forced the gas mask onto him. I twisted the switch thing round and round until it could not go round anymore. Dr. Simmons looked in unimaginable pain. He was gagging and screaming, as I was yesterday. Serves you right, I shouted. I ran out of that room, and I don't know how, but I found my way out of that clinic. I just remember a security guard trying to stop me, but I punched him in the face and took his keys. The trouble with that adrenaline is that everything happens so fast. I made my break for freedom. I was on the run for a very long time after that. Dr. Simmons against all odds survived that day and died five years later of a heart attack. Sounds like a lovely chap, Sir remarked, rubbing his pointy, wrinkly chin. A pussycat compared to his uncle, apparently. I raised an eyebrow at this. My colleagues had his uncle do those experiments of his on him, while his secondary school bully taunted him with insults. To be honest, I'm actually a bit jealous. I wish I could be with them. How do I get out of here? I asked to Phil Rue. He gave me a look of pure dread and just said, Get to Worthing. Then there was this flash and Sir Philru was gone. I don't know why he made me retell the story about Dr. Simmons. Was it some kind of mind game for his own pleasure? He had had his fun with me. For now, anyway. I carried on walking for another two miles or so, walking through the gravelly and occasionally muddy footpath. Nothing really happened. It was extremely hot, though. I had to take my jacket off and put it over my shoulder. I walked past things I remembered from my childhood. To the right of me, fields with cows that all seemed to stand in a line and stare at me. I always felt like they did that because they knew what I was like as a person, and they were looking at me with accusing eyes. To the left of me, hills with cottages on them, that always seemed to have smoking chimneys and flowers and trees surrounding them. Fences and roads that connected them to other towns and places. To me, this wasn't so bad. Just like the tea shop, it gave me some comfort. Both of these things were separated by a stream of water that seemed to go on even past earthing. I never found out where it ended. I looked to my right to see if the cows were giving me that accusing look I hated so much. The cows were all in a straight line, staring at me as per usual, but they looked mistreated and malnourished. Their eyes were glowing red, and there were no longer any black patches on them. They were all white, so that you could see what was written on them in red crayon. Some of them had pictures of people being burnt alive on them. Others had pictures of people being mutilated with machetes. Others had pictures depicting people being beaten by large groups of people with baseball bats. And of course, there were the rude words. These creatures were like sadistic toddlers. One cow that was standing right in the middle started walking towards the water that separated us. I expected a moo. Surely they would have at least left the noise the animal makes the same to keep some sort of normality, wishful thinking. Instead, it was growling like some kind of monster. The fence that kept the cows in. The door was opened. Sir Phil Rue's doing, I thought. The cow didn't have the usual drawings and markings on it. It had what looked like a very well done tattoo. A tattoo of my face. With the eyes scratched out, just like the paintings in the tea shop, with my mouth stitched shut, and the words suffer, Colin, suffer. The first two words were written above, and the third word was written below, all in an Edwardian style joined up writing. I didn't want another confrontation, so I ran away, again. The cow let out a mighty roar like hundreds of tigers all at once as I ran from it. I did not fancy my chances. As I ran, the symptoms returned. The whooshing, the headaches, the distortion of my vision all came back, more agonizing than ever before. Writing in red crayon saying, Suffer, Colin, suffer, appeared on the footpath. The sky turned red, and I could just about see the sun had transformed into one menacing, disturbing-looking eye. A very familiar-looking eye. One of the eyes of Sephilru. 
My walkie-talkie began to buzz and ring like a telephone. With my last ounce of strength, I picked it up and pressed the button on the side. Then my symptoms stopped. Everything went back to normal. Hello, Colin. Enjoying the wildlife, I see. I thought I'd check in, see how you were doing. My symptoms had gone again, like they were Sifilru's sick calling card. Coming to my feet, recovering from the pain, I mustered the words, What do you want now? I thought after the ordeal you just had you'd like some kind of kind words or company, said that eerie voice in the walkie-talkie. And even though I can't be there in person just yet, I just wanted to let you know that Mr. Struthers is just around the corner in his boat, waiting for you, so you'll have company from him soon. Mr. Struthers was an old man who sat on his boat, either painting, fishing, reading, or listening to music. I always found him a very three-dimensional character, a multitude of interests. He had a very bushy beard, he wore a straw hat, and wore checkered tops with beige trousers and hiking boots. His demeanour was always friendly, and never cold, and he was never unkind to me or my mother. He would always invite us on his canal barge for a cup of tea and a chat. He would do the usual old man thing, and tell me stories about what they did when he was my age, and the war, and blah blah blah. One day, when I was eleven years old, I was in a particularly bad mood because of something that had happened in school. I had a face like thunder, and Mr. Struthers asked me what was wrong. Don't mind him, he's just being miserable because he had a fight in school. My mother said, a friendly and booming, Ah! came out of Mr. Struthers' mouth. My mother sat me down next to Mr. Struthers' scarecrow ragaboo that he had kept from when he was a farmer. Like I said, a multitude of interests. There was nothing intimidating whatsoever about ragaboo. I didn't know how Mr. Struthers expected him to keep his field safe. Apart from the straw and the hand-stitched eyes, he looked like a man-sized cuddly toy in dungarees. Mr. Struthers knelt down in front of me. He whispers, Don't worry. You know, when I was young, I got into a scrape at school. My mother would be like that with me too. She means well, your mum. I gave a slight smile and he tussled my hair. I drank too much tea today, he exclaimed. That was something he said quite a lot. I don't care if you do like your tea, my mother replied. It was like she had to say something, even when she couldn't think of anything to say. My mother loved conversation, and she always felt obligation to keep it going. Now then, young Colin, what do you think of my latest artwork, then? He went into his small kitchen on his boat. It was this beautiful picture of... Of his boat on the water, in all of its glory. Red and green paint, roses, golden writing that said the glory be, that was the name of the barge. And he was so proud of it. It was his home, where he had retired. The thought of what happened in school built inside of me and spread like a virus. I could feel myself falling into unimaginable rage. Once my mother and Mr. Struthers went onto the deck of the glory be for some fresh air and more gossip. I grabbed that painting and shoved it in the oven. The heat dial went all the way up to 400, and I made sure it was as far as it could go. I watched as the paint and canvas burnt and twisted and melted, and I felt in control. But then, I felt a huge what-have-I-done tidal wave overcome me. Then the fire started. Mr. Struthers and my mother smelt the burning and saw the raging fire burning in the kitchen, not again, Colin. My mother yelled. Mr. Struthers grabbed me and ran off the barge with my mother right behind him. They watched as the inside of the Glory Bee was engulfed in flames. Before you mention the water, it was all the furniture and the inside that was on fire. But this was Kevin Struthers' home. I looked over at him. He was staring at the Glory Bee with a look of shock, fear and suffering on his face. He uttered words that my guilt would cause me to adopt from that moment onwards. You don't disrespect the masterpiece. I was sent away to live with a very strict uncle, who would sometimes hit me with his belt after that. Buckle or strap, Colin. I came around the corner, expecting to find the glory be all demonic and spooky looking, 
but it wasn't. It was just like it was before I burnt its insides down. I climbed on board and was greeted by Mr. Struthers, exactly as he always was, friendly, jolly and wise looking. Ah, oh, young Colin, come and have a look at my latest artwork, he said, but he had no new artwork. It was just ragaboo. It was then alarm bells were triggered. I turned to him and asked, Do you remember what I did, Mr. Struthers? Don't worry about that, Colin. Water under the bridge or fire inside the barge. <laughs> he chuckled. To show you there's no hard feelings, Ragabrew has a surprise for you. He said ominously. I looked closer at the scarecrow and it sprung up and pushed me to the floor. I watched in horror as it started to walk towards me with murderous intent. The glory bee had transformed into what I had done to it. Burned, wrecked. I instantly thought, I did this. This was my fault. I couldn't control myself. I needed to feel in control. I looked over at Mr. Struthers. He had become just like those teenagers on the other barge. Black eyes, bad skin, greasy hair under the hat. The claws were there too. Everything was there. Ragaboo's hand-stitched eyes had blood dripping from them, and they looked rotted and infected. His formerly non-threatening gaze, from when he was inanimate, had become one of vengeance and a thirst for blood. Ragaboo picked up a rusty axe that was on a burnt but stood upright table. How did you do this to me, Colin? This was my home. All I had. Mr. Struthers grabbed me. No, please, I begged him. I don't want to hurt you, and I don't want you to hurt me. I'm sorry, please. It's too late, Ragaboo said in a fearsome voice with blood spilling out of his stitched mouth that ripped open. He started to grunt and growl like the cows from earlier. Please, no, I'm sorry. Then, Sephilru appeared behind them. No, not yet, gents, he told them, rubbing his hands together. In Earthing... He will be yours. I told you he has to get to Earthing. Then the two of them just let go of me. I ran off the boat. Red sky, Sephilru's sinister eye replacing the sun, trees and grass dead and rotted. The water had become blood, and the words Suffer, Colin, Suffer were written on the ground. Then, despite my injuries, I ran all the way to Earthing. I had had enough of this ordeal, and I wanted it to be over. So I ran to Earthing as fast as I could. When I arrived at Earthing, it was dusk. I saw that the cobblestone houses with smoky chimneys were there, but the sky was red, and that evil eye was watching my every move. I walked past the butcher's shop. Everything seemed normal, and then a flash of lightning struck, and there was a huge knife struck right through the ham that was in the window. And the words suffer, Colin, suffer, written in red crayon, also on the window. I knew I was in for a final showdown. I never questioned how red crayon would show on certain things like paintings and boats and windows, but I thought these creatures had the minds of children, and nothing rational mattered to them. Then I heard another loud thud. I looked behind me, and Sephilru was stood there. Do you still have that walkie-talkie? He asked. I pulled it out of my jacket pocket and held it up. You will need it, he said, and pointed to the fountain, with the big tree that towered over it. I looked at the fountain and saw that it looked like blood was dripping into the water. Blood is thicker than water, said a voice that sounded like one of the creatures from behind me. I turned around, and it was my mother, in creature form. A flash of lightning struck, and I looked behind me. There I was my body dangling from the tree by a rope over the fountain. A crowbar forced right through my neck. I began to make a run for it. Won't do you any good to run, Colin, called Sir Phil. Lightning struck again, this time almost hitting me. Don't be so ungrateful, Colin. We're only trying to help you. That was a quote I really didn't want to hear. It was Dr. Simmons with a gas mask and canister. I turned around and ran towards the pub. As I approached the pub, there were several other flashes of lightning around me. 
Mr. Struthers, Ragaboo, my mother, the teenagers, the owner of the tea shop, the various police officers that arrested me over the years, were all coming for me. But I could still get to the pub. But first, I ran into the pub. I chose the pub, because there was always a large keg of something highly flammable there. But first, I ran inside the pub. I remembered the landlord, Jack O'Connell, always had this lighter that he would often carelessly leave on the counter. And as a child, I stole it a few times and played with it. Looking for this, said the demonic version of Jack, holding it and waving it. I don't have time for this, I screamed, and kicked him to the ground and then punched him and took the lighter from him. I ran back outside the keg, and with all my strength, I emptied the keg onto the ground as quick as I could, and then I sparked the lighter. It didn't take long for the blaze to spread. The creatures and Safilru were approaching. Hey, Safilru! I shouted. Some guide you were. I'll never forget the look of shock on his creepy face. I grabbed Dr. Simmons and threw him into the fire first because I hated him the most, obviously. Then a couple of the policemen. They were all screaming in pain. They were burning. The leader of the teenagers grabbed me from behind and began to claw at my face. I threw him over my shoulders. He spun around in the air and his legs landed in the fire that had now spread even more. The blaze spread across his clothes quickly. I looked over to see that Ragaboo had caught fire and fallen to his knees while his arms fell off simultaneously. That scarecrow looked in unimaginable agony. Mr. Struthers had his head in his hands mourning the loss of Ragaboo. The last thing I saw of him was the fire about to consume him. It was devouring the entire town of Irthing. Cobblestone buildings exploded as the fire caused their various appliances to blow up. Trees burning and falling down, crushing others. But then I remembered, this was not earthing, not really. With most of the creatures gone, and the few surviving ones distracted, I ran for my life out of earthing and towards the mountain. It felt like nothing could stop me. Then the walkie-talkie started to buzz and ring again. I pressed the button thinking this was someone saying, You've passed the test, you can return to normality, or this was just a dream. Not quite. It was Philru. Colin. There was a long pause. You need to send out an SOS. Then the channel went dead. My symptoms returned. It felt like my head was going to explode. I passed out. I awoke in the daylight. At the very start of that walk on the aqueduct. I was so frustrated. I kicked the wall that prevented people from falling to their deaths. I saw the walkie-talkie with a note written on it in red crayon saying, Send the SOS. Tell your story. Oh, and there was a fruit basket too. So here we are, whoever you are, listening to this on the end of this channel. I don't know when and if I'll get out of here, but what puzzles me more about my whole ordeal is the criteria for being placed in this sort of situation. You see, the thing is... I've done some bad things, but I never killed anyone. To whom it may concern, thank you for taking time to listen to this broadcast. We, the Intuitionites, like to run things very smoothly. We realize that you regular people finding these walkie-talkies and listening to these stories by our residents may think this is all fake. Well, how do you explain the fact that you felt compelled to answer? when you heard the device buzzing and ringing? How do you explain the fact that you just couldn't stop listening? And how do you explain the dark figures that you sometimes see at night, in the corner of your eye, in the shadows, watching you, just waiting for their chance to bring you to us? The simple fact is, the broadcast found you because you're next and we'll be welcoming you very soon.